<coughs> okay. Hi everyone. This is the international business presentation on country focus. This time it is my country Malaysia. As you can see from the PowerPoint here, it's famous for the two towers over there and as well as the possible weather that you have you guys are accustomed to. Why? Because it is below Thailand and above the tiny Singapore. Let me show you where it is. Okay. It sits right here on this part of the map and I think you can see that that's the little thing there that is Taiwan. So this is the comparison of the size between Taiwan and Malaysia. So the world map is not that accurate anymore, isn't it? Because if I were to look at the map, I would think that Taiwan is possibly the size of maybe half of Malaysia. But apparently it's not. On square meters, Taiwan is almost nine times smaller than Malaysia. So that means driving across Malaysia is almost as long as driving vertically across Taiwan. And yeah, that is quite a big difference. Weather all year round is tropical, as you can see from the weather chart over here. If it's any other nation, I'm pretty sure the bottom can be touched and brick upon very easily. But in Malaysia, you can see it's very nicely. Only 14 centimeter, 14, 14 Celsius of differences. And all year round, it's almost the same. And that means we don't have to change our clothes or do anything. We can just buy one suit and it matches all season. The only weather we get is monsoon and interval haze season and yeah as for our population it's at 32.37 32 million which is about 10 million more than Taiwan but that's not much really because we have a lot more land and most of the people here actually lives on this part of the land because this part of the land is at the strategic location of trade on this Malacca Street. And on this part of the land is more of the aboriginals and also the tourist that wants to visit the tropical forest. And this place is actually kind of pretty. I've been there before, the other part of Malaysia. And In this presentation though, I'm not gonna just like present my nation in a more broad way. I'm gonna present my nation in a business way. And yeah, I'm gonna tell you guys what what's so special about Malaysia and why I think it is one of the most uh, best places for business in Asia and also maybe in Asian countries if you consider the neighbors so for that to work I have to first start by telling you guys the history the culture the politics and the society of Malaysia it's not gonna be boring I promise you okay so, oh wait, let's skip this part. Okay, so you can see here there are three pictures, and these are going to help me explain the history of Malaysia before the 20th century when people start to go there. So, before then, it actually dates a long way back on ancient Indian society where Malaysia this land this this I don't know what this land is it looks very 
unfamiliar. I don't know what this land is, but it's the oldest known painting of Malaysia, found in Indian literature. So, on the record, Malaysia is actually called Suvarnadivipa, or called the Golden Peninsula. Why? Because apparently there's some traces of gold found in this place, and also the other resources of a normal tropical place because it's it's very near the spice islands and this meant that china and india were the very first people to come and explore this place and set up trade with the locals and that actually happened at the first century bce not as far back as some his as some of your you know my classmates countries but Still, it, it means that Malaysia since the beginning is a place for trade. And India has been the main influencer of this piece of land until the 30th century, where Islamic traders from Arab and India began to come into this place and introduce their religion, Islam, which has been a major player of everything in this part. Well, the situation till 13th century has been rather nice and calm with only trade happening until when the Europeans start to conquer. And it starts with the Netherlands, Dutch East India Company in the 17th century. So when the Dutch arrive to Malaysia, it opens its doorway to the infamous trading route with the Europe and since it occupies in a very strategic tra trading route like you can see this is the Malacca Strait I was talking about you can see that it is at the southernmost part of Asia so every ship that comes from China has to go through this part here to continue its journey on onto Europe so for those that controls this part the Malacca Strait they will automatically have the ability to collect taxes and also control the trade. It means more power. And that is why when they got there, they went straight to Malacca and they straight up conquered this region for themselves. And this is actually a church in Malacca, Christ Church. Yeah, you can see it's established in a very, very early date. And if you can see, it's a lot similar to the one you found in Damsui. And if you guys know some history, you'll know that Dutch is not the only people that conquers. Britain also is one of them, the English traders. Though, until now, English traders were just traders in this region. It's mostly occupied by the, by the Dutch. But eventually, Napoleon happened in the Europe theater and Napoleon lost the war and as a price Malacca was traded to the British as a compensation it's sort of like a trading with what you have and the British having set up their base there they found that it's a very very good spot for their trade and eventually after the compensation period is over like Hong Kong returned back to Dutch and the British forces actually moved their headquarters to down here. You see this little land here? That's actually Singapore. And that is why Singapore has a very early development of being a trading place. Because the British can't hold on to Malacca. And a while later, British and the Dutch, they are too tired of meeting each other, like having to settle their trade in the dispute, so they signed a treaty called the Anglo-Dutch Treaty, which means this Malaysian Peninsula, Malay Peninsula, belongs to the British, and the part underneath, Indonesia, belongs to the Dutch. And that's pretty much the history before 20th century. And as we enter the 20th century, we see a lot more things happening so don't don't fall asleep now 
So, under the British rulership, Malaysia is obviously going to be like the base for the British army during the World War II. And Japan, having saw that this region is obviously going to give them, give the allies an edge over them when war happened. So, Japan attacked this place and invaded Malaysia. And it was a hard time for Malaysians, as my grandmother can recall. It was really terrifying. And why is it terrifying? It's not because they, not only because they kill the people, but also because it cuts the trade between Malaysia and the Europe and the rest of the world. And that's why the mass unemployment killed a lot more people. And this gives Malaysians a sense that they should be independent in order to be free from the possibility that this thing will happen again. And surprisingly, during this time, communism starts to tr start to spread within the region. And it's called Malaysian Communist Party, mainly by Chinese who fled here from uh, the many wars that happened in China before 1930s. And actually they helped the Allies defeat the Japanese during World War II. Yeah, that was before communism was a bad thing. And uh, Malaysian Communist Party, which I'm going to call MCP now, actually stands as an interesting point of conflict for the British rulers. As you know, communism is in a way for world peace, according to USA. The British declared national emergency status for fear of communism rulership, as MCP is still rather relevant in Malaysia at that time. So they become the enemy of ordinary Malaysian citizens who aren't a part of communism. And the Chinese that were not a part of that actually formed the Malaysian Chinese Association, MCA. And why do I mention it even in the slides? Because it's actually, they are actually very important for dictating the Malaysia we know today. First, between 1955 and 1956, they negotiated with the British to establish the principle of equal citizenship for all races. And as an exchange, the MCA said that they will agree to exchange the head of state to the Malays, the majority of Malaysia. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but we will see. And then in 1959, Lee Kuan Yew, if you know him, the infamous leader of Singapore, became the leader of the Singapore Autonomy State, because at that time, Singapore is actually quite a relevant area. And so that means Singapore was part of Malaysia back then. Yes, they are. And Lee Kuan Yew actually proposed the idea of independence with the Malaysian leader at that time. And together, through negotiations, they independent. They gain independence with Malaya, the peninsula, North Borneo, the part of the other half of Malaysia, Sarawak, also one of it, and Singapore. And we call that day Merdeka, which means for Malay is freedom, I mean independence. And these are the photos you can see. And yeah, so at that time Malaysia is actually quite big, quite relevant. This is Lee Kuan Yew, this is the day when the Merdeka was announced, and this is where they signed the treaty and announced the independence. And this is actually the memorial for the people who fought for Malaysia's freedom from Japan. And yeah, the nation Malaysia was formed and what's, what can possibly happen next? Well, oh wait, that will come later. Eventually, the fact that MCA 
Wanted Malays to be the leadership seat came with a side effect, which is that the Chinese that came into this nation are so good at doing business that the Malays tend to be at a disadvantage. So as more and more Chinese gain success in Malaysia by doing business or whatever, the business-centric Chinese quickly made the Malays feel like they were being pressured, they were being abused, and always at a disadvantage. And obviously they were not happy. So racial tensions were actually at its highest in the 1960s, and eventually this happened. You can see on the newspaper, it says Singapore is out. Out from where? Out from Malaysia. And this was actually conducted by the Malaysian parliament, where they voted 136 to 0 to say Singapore, you are out. And the reason? Because they are afraid that the Chinese, because Singapore has a majority share of Chinese people, they are afraid that this place will lead the Chinese to overthrow the Malaysia government of Malays, or basically just out, out fighting them in terms of doing business. So they want to make sure that the Malays are treated fairly. So I want to make a point that Malay and Chinese are different kind of people, even though they are Malaysians. And Lee Kuan Yew at that time had to leave the island alone when this happened. And this actually marked the beginning of racial equality in Malaysia. Yeah. Malay people are favorite. And in Singapore, it is actually racially equalized because Malays are not as high of a proportion as Malaysia, as we'll see later. And we all know what eventually happened is that, yeah, Singapore rose to power and as we all know right now, nobody knows what Malaysia is, they all know Singapore. And eventually the Chinese in Malaysia are still too powerful and the Malaysian government eventually steps in and establish policies to share the wealth and the opportunities the Chinese have. And that is one of the reasons why Malaysia is not on par with South Korea or Taiwan because Malaysia at that time was actually on the same growth pace as Taiwan and South Korea but because they have to comply with the racial tension of the region. They have to sacrifice the potentials the Chinese can bring and give the majority the decisions they liked. And then we go to the 21st century. Entering the modern Malaysia, well, Malaysia has always been on the strategic trading route, so the nation rise, eventually. And in this day and age, the position of Malaysia is actually rotated on the second seat. So Malaysia, Vietnam and Thailand, they are all competing competing for the second seat in the Asian country standing. And because the government has yet to abolish its policy to favor Malays, the education system still favors the race Malay. So for example, Universities were taught fully in Malay if they are nationalized. University of Malaya taught in Malay. My, that's why most of my high school friends, they went to private colleges in Malaysia or maybe study abroad like me because they don't want to have their education being suffocated by having priorities for Malays. And 
This is why I feel like the country of Malaysia still feels a bit like a one-party nation because Malays they are still guiding the nation. They are still the only government leaders. And yeah, I think it is. It is not a good thing for Malaysia, but not to say that Malays are all bad people. In fact, I will say that one of the person I will talk about, the Prime Minister Mahathir Muhammad, is one of the most influential Malays I can think of because he is the reason why Malaysia is able to be as competitive as. Vietnam, Thailand, or Indonesia, because he launched the nation onto the momentum to change that carried on onto this very day between nineteen eighty one and two thousand three. So I'll cover him later, and then we'll come to the cultures, and yeah, we have three cultures actually. We don't have we don't only have just one. So, Malaysia is one nation, but it's like America in terms of ethnic population spread. One majority race exists besides many other minorities. So the first one is Malay, or Bumi Putera. Bumi Putera, at sixty nine point seven percent of the race. Though, if you are wondering if they are the original people of Malaysia, I would say they are not. The original peoples are called Orang Asli. They are the real Aboriginals. Malay is not. Yes, I know it's ridiculous. <laughs> then we go to the Chinese, which is at twenty two point five percent. There's a majority coming from Guangdong, Fujian, and Hainan. And I actually, my actually, my ancestry came from Guangdong. So, yeah. Indian. Consists of six point eight percent coming from India's southern state of Tamil Nadu. Yeah. So, as I said before, the government sees is mostly occupied by Malays only. So, in terms of government bodies, we Chinese and Indians have no part of it. But in terms of economics, we are because Chinese and Indians are ha- all had overall higher average income till this day. And then. You can see this is the population spread. This is the Bumi Putera, the Malays, the greenest are the Malays. The reddest are areas where Chinese has more population. So you can see that in Kuala Lumpur itself is mixed mixed, but in other regions it's a lot of Malays. So yeah, you'll see a lot more Chinese coming from the red regions than the green regions. And let me tell you. Having been to the green regions, there are no Chinese there. Okay, so for language, again, each race has their own language. So altogether, we have three official language: Chinese, Malay, and English. No, most of the time, English is preferred. Uh, all Malays are by national Islamic law. To be Islamic, yes, I think that's the thing that most of you might know. And as far as I know, no expe- no exceptions are allowed, even if a Malay marries a Chinese, because at that time the whole family will be forced to convert to Islam. Yeah. So, for the Chinese in Malaysia, they actually speak a lot more than Mandarin, which is Chinese. We also speak Cantonese. Hokkien, Hakka, Hainanese, and Fuzhou. And for the Indian community, they speak Tamil, which is Indian one one of the Indian language. And also, they have a very strong connection with the Hindu religion. So we actually can see a lot of Hindu temples in the neighborhood. And yeah. It's really kind of miracle that we all live together very harmoni- harmoniously. So, all three religions have very different holidays, foods, and and culture. 
So, for example, the food is a mix of all three, and so we actually are able to get a lot more done in a very close neighborhood. Like we can get Chinese, Indian, Malay, all in street, all in the same street. So. This creates a culture where people like me would want desire for a variety of foods. And sometimes the food is not, I would say the food is not always as clean as it is. Or maybe it is very, very heavy flavored. But I would say our stomachs are very strong. Yeah. So, as for holidays, we actually have a lot of holidays, national holidays. So if you're gonna work there or anything, you get to enjoy those. As for the special mix, I would say is the hot, the New Year's because due to the existence of three cultures, we actually have to celebrate three New Year's in one year. So the first one is obviously Chinese New Year, and then the Malays is Hari Raya. The Indians, I forgot the name, but I think it's a another time of the year. Though the duration of the holidays is less than what China or India or somewhere else might re might be required to have, but still it's a reminder to the rest of us that there's a lot more people in Malaysia, a lot more different kinds of people. And national religion of Malaysia is Islam. That means the Sharia law of Islamic from the book of Quran is applied to national law. So yeah, it actually regulates a lot of things that we have in the country and we have to comply. So freedom of press is no. Yes, it's not as ridiculous as China, but it's still there. And this applies to food as well because it means that there is a halal tag and that means most of the time I won't be able to eat pork in public restaurants. I can only eat those in Malaysia if I go to specific vendors. Mm -hmm. And then because there's a lot of culture I think you have got to be mixed up by all those. So, I'll sum up, sum up the core concepts of Malaysia into a few words. So the first word is gentleness. As Malaysians, we are more gentle people. We don't really want to like barge in and scream or do anything. The next one is booty, which is the, re the respect on all things. So booty is actually a Malay word that that was used by Malays to describe how they should deal with their life in terms of how they react with events. So because Malays are very religious, they think that a lot of things is God's will. So it's why they will be like, oh, so your car got scratched by something. Oh, too bad. But I hope that something, somebody will give you something else to repair the cost. That's booty. Because they'll think that it's the Allah's will or something. Respect, because in this whole mix of culture, it's very hard to, it's very kind of very hard to say like, oh, you don't respect people. Because if you don't, you won't be able to deal with those people. You have to meet a lot of people every day. You have to know how to be respectful. Otherwise, you'll be overwhelmed. Courtesy is more for business because we don't know who we meet. Like, we don't have a standardized culture. So courtesy is the best way to ensure that you are more addressable. Modesty, so we don't like to wear flashy clothes. Like some people in some countries like to wear very flashy clothes. Or revealing clothes we will say no don't wear those in fact we we will ban people from wearing those in some places and then as we go into the into the other places 
we also have face. So because it's a culture with a lot of different kinds of people, we also have face. And I think it's more of an influence from Chinese. Yeah. Uh, not only Chinese. And then we also have diversity. And that is obviously because we have a lot of kind of people. And then for the immigrants of Malaysia, is actually is actually more of the Chinese is that they have extra diligence and resilience as characteristic because they came through the hard hard road of coming to Malaysia on boats or whatever the they walk. And I think that's all the characteristics of me is that I'm very resilient and also very diligent. And a lot of Chinese from Malaysia have this. And yeah, I think is these core concepts are what describe best describes Malaysian in a few words because consider this that we have a history of a lot of kind of a lot of people we deal with all kinds of race, all kinds of culture every day. It's very hard for us to not be gentle and respectful towards others because we can meet a lot of different kind of things every day. So it's best to just be gentle and respect what they have. Otherwise, you'll be in a very bad mood every day. As for business cultures, we have a high degree of respect for hierarchy and also face. So during meetings, we tend to start meetings late because punctuality is actually low priority in Malaysian society. I know somebody has experienced that. And entering a meeting could mean you have a designated seat and you have to greet every person individually in the meeting. As for making a decision, it's best that you consider all members into the decision making and that's why meetings can get very very long and this is also where you have to be respectful of all religions because if you have Malay employees they're gonna be Islam and Islamic employees will have prayer time which is five times a day so you have to give them time to like you know in the picture to go to the specific designated room in the company where they can face the direction of Mika to pray. As for some surprising things is that we might ask questions about your family or your personal life or your ethnicity which might appear, appear too direct or personal. It is not meant that we are <laughs> trying to be pervy or anything, it's just that it's a way of, it is what we will do. So we are not going to be surprised if you ask the same question back. So maybe if you meet a Malaysian, be understandable and ask us back. We will answer it. So in terms of face, we actually wouldn't give a direct negative response to the proposals you make even if you don't agree with it. So in terms of things like that happening in the future, if you meet a Malaysian employee, just ask them open-ended questions and double check with them. So I would say this is that the business card ethic is also present. It's almost the same as Japan. And corruption index is at number 57 globally. Though, I will say that even though it is better than the neighbors because Thailand and Indonesia are the 100th rank, which means globally they are at the bottom end. But I will say Malaysia's ranking of 57 is not that good either. Then we go to the politics. And, uh, yeah. I know it is a very long thing to say, but... I think politics presents 
as a very important thing to understand about Malaysia because we are so diverse in culture that it needs time to understand. So, politics of Malaysia takes place in the framework of federal representative democratic constitutional monarchy. A lot of words are explained in a very, very simple term. So, federal means power is divided equally among the states of the nation. So, the head of state, which will be in rotation among the different states, Sultan will be called the Yang Di Pertuan Agong, which is what this this logo means. And this is they have almost the same power as the prime minister, as if the they pull they both them simultaneously exist. And then we have the democratic rep representative democratic, which means we will have a vote and we will see who will represent the nation and that for that case it is a prime minister it's like a president in other countries and for the constitution of malaysia we are using the westminster westminster system from england because you know, we are ruled by them as for elections, like democratic nations, we have multi-party system. Though, for the past 61 years, not counting from this year, but counting from 2018, we had only one party that ruled the entire, the, the entire democratic constitution, which is Barisan National. National. You can see that this word is actually English, but in Malay is but written that way. And it, they actually almost broke the world record for the longest, like, continuously breaking the world record for the longest one party country until 2018. They lost their seat. Finally. And this, the reason they lost is actually because the person who got onto the seat was actually a person I mentioned from the history section above. And can anybody guess to whom the Barisan National War lost their elections? And the hint is he actually got onto the seat as Prime Minister at a very, very old age. Nobody knows? And there you go. Prime Minister, PM, in focus, Dr. Mahathir Muhammad. So. In his case, the reason why I talk about him is because he is so influential to the modern Malaysia that I think without covering him, it would be a shame. And to understand Malaysia in the future age, it is best to see what Dr. Muhammad, Mahathir Muhammad has done to the nation. So, Mahathir owns the record for the longest serving leader of Malaysia from 1982 to 2004 for his fourth term and then later on the two years going to be covered later so he's the reason why the nation was in such a strong position because at first he was inherited with the new economic policy from the previous predecessors to improve the, the economy position of the Bumi Puteras. And does anybody remember what does this word stands for? Okay, yes, the Malays. So Mahathir actually enforced a stronger impact than the previous prime ministers because he made two important economy changes. So first, oh okay, this is actually not following the order of the PPT, I'm sorry. So first is that at that time, English Great Britain's Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher pushed for privatization of government enterprises. And a lot of countries actually followed what she did, which Mahathir and many other countries saw as a great way to push the nation forward. Good thing he did, because 
the nation grew exponentially as a result. And second, Mahathir has a strong desire to help the Mubin Patera race, their race. And by privatizing the firms, it starts off a chain reaction that enables more of the Malay to be employed. And by that I mean he enforced policies for the guaranteed seats for that particular race of people. Well, and then he also, while he was in office, he actually enforced the construction of the National North South Highway, North South Expressway, which is the highway that I commuted on very often when I want to go to Singapore. It's a five hour drive down and it is the best highway to get there if you don't want to fly. And actually it connects all the way to Penang. And then we also had a new international airport constructed by this very majestic man. Before that, the international airport is actually besides my house in Subang. And then, yeah, you can actually see that Petros Twin Tower was also his work. This bridge, the Penang Bridge, also his work. This bridge is actually pretty darn amazing. It's an engineering marvel. And also, he established the success for Proton. And if you guys remember my first presentation on chapter 1 of International Business, what is Proton and what do they make? Uh, yes, it is a car manufacturer, if you can see from this picture, and they make horrible products. Anyway, in 1991, the new economic policy that heavily favors the Malays came to an end, and then Mahathir enforced a new target called Vision 2020. On that vision, he said that he's going to lead the country to become a developed nation by 2020. Oh, that didn't work out, obviously, because we are in 2031. Uh, nevertheless, Mahathir is still a very good Prime Minister in terms of the economic effort because he actually led Malaysia through the 1997 Asian financial crisis without IMF funding. Yes, the reason why is because he enforced the solution to the financial crisis is to pack the Malaysian ringgit to US dollars, which before then was a free, fl free floating currency. And he also increased government spending, which obviously is not what the IMF wanted, but so he rejected the funding, so what he can do is what he can do. And yeah, it was a very good time for Malaysia. It brought gross, great prosperity for the nation, and I think there's some of the reasons why he can serve for five terms between 1982 and 2004. That's a long time. A lot of us were born in that period. So, following his retirement, he actually personally helped the of sworn in office from the sixth president, Prime Minister Najib Razak. And if you know a little bit about Malaysia, you will know that he's not a good man. So, Mahathir knows that, and also he sees there's an opportunity to come back to the seat. And this is where we end up with the second Mahathir. He returns to the seat and returns to election for Prime Minister at 2018 under the banner of Pakatan Harapan. And... As you can see from this picture, this is when he's he got the seat. Yeah, he's very happy. You know at that time he's 92 years old? Yeah. It was a memorable moment for all Malaysians, especially the Chinese, because at that time Mahathir promises to destroy what Malaysia is unfair about. 
the Malay favoritism, the Malay culture focus, and the Malay education. And although he, in the end, he didn't actually do that. What he did, that we like, is he did a complete crackdown on. On the. On what Najib did, the one MDB scandal, and. Yeah. It was. In fact, the whole show. Of one MDB scandal. Is, in this book, the do- billion dollar wheel. In fact, I will I will prefer you guys to understand what happened in that book, or maybe you will see it in the theaters coming soon because it's actually gonna be shot into a movie. And he was at that time a national hero. In fact, he is actually on the trajectory to maybe change the nation once and for all. Until. When he is not, so in 2020, February 24, Mahathir submitted his resignation from the Prime Minister to the Sultan. Actually, it was a lot very disturbing story, and I'm gonna try explain here. So when Mahathir was Negotiating with his prime minister run, he actually told his party that because he is very old, at the second year of his term, he is gonna do a transition of power to his deputy, so that he might, you know, if things go wrong, there will be a leader. And eventually, Mahathir thought that you know I'm strong enough to sustain myself, so I'm gonna submit a resignation letter to the Sultan. So that I can try again and get another four years. This is what he is trying to do. And yeah, it was a very disturbing run in Malaysia. If you know, you see in the news that Malaysia lost the pr- prime minister and then gained the prime minister and then lost again. We changed three prime ministers in the past four years. That's really amazing. But I think Mahathir. Did what he could to make Malaysia the way it is today. Though there is also a racist side. So, if you have seen this PPT for long enough, you'll notice that on the right there's a newspaper. This is actually written by the Malaysia's biggest Chinese newspaper company, Sinchu Daily. This is actually a very new newspaper, December fourteenth. And the words are very small, so I'm gonna try explain it. So, in this news article, before then, Mahathir, even though he is not prime minister anymore, he attacks the newspaper for promoting ideas that would disrupt the national peace. So, what he says in there is that Mahathir credited the unified education system for the cross-cultural success. Which is what we have in Malaysia right now, and he criticized the multicultural education that I am a part of in the private schools for tearing the nation apart. And he also says that the Malay populations were very caring for the other races that we they accepted the race. So for Chinese and Indians, we should learn what the Malays were doing, accept their culture, so that. Malay can, Malaysia can move forward with just a Malay culture, learn the ways of Malay. And obviously, hearing those, you might think, "Oh, as a Malay, I think this is very honorable. I will support you." But for Chinese, this is extremely, extremely racist. He's trying to say that the reason. Malaysia can have peace between race is because there's a unified education system and also tolerance for Malay. 
Well, it is not. It is a tolerance of all races in that we are actually living in harmonious together without you saying all these things. So, trying to tell us what is causing us to be separated is like say, telling everybody a lie that doesn't exist and hoping that he can gain the supporters from those that believe him. Yeah. I think Mahadi is very racist on this part. And this is the sad truth of Malaysia's politics or government, which is that we are very racist. Uh, the reason why I say this is a bad thing about Mahathir, why he's wrong, is because during his 2018 run for the Prime Minister's seat, he actually got, gathered a lot of support from the Chinese. My father voted for him, so that means the 30% of the national vote goes to him. He promised the Malaysians a new Malaysia. And but by the time when he got onto the seat, I tell you, at that time, people were going to the streets, we are celebrating, we are having parties, because we know that the very, the very wicked one-party government is finally going to change. And Mahathir resigned, and it didn't happen. He gave us a lot of false hope that Malaysia might change for once, but that didn't happen. But what I'm trying to say is, yes, he is a very reason why Malaysia, Malaysia is able to grow to this much. He is an influential leader. He managed to forge a nation out of a lot of different cultures and make sure that the minority race, the minority race, the Malays, gets to advance economically. And I think that's a good thing because the nation gets to be helped unifiedly. But I would say that it is not the best way. Like, you know, there's a one, one part of the land you kick out where they have equal policies and they manage to grow a lot. Maybe you are wrong. So I think Mahathir still did his part, but on this part, He's just wrong. And the main reason why Malaysians are able to unite is because we respect, we cultivate, and we endure the differences of one another with patience. And I think in the long run, under the rulership of Malay as a government, we will never see a day where we can be treated equally. And this is a sad truth for Malaysia. All right. Now for politics, let's look at the new things, okay? So we look at the economy position, the economy and market situation of Malaysia. So starting off with the currency of Malaysia, we use Malaysian Ringgit, MYR or Lingji, or then we call it Ringgit Malaya RM locally. So. We, it's not a currency that's traded freely on the international market. It's just like uh, halfway there. It has free floating currency, but then it, it's not traded freely because Mahathir did what he can. And, and then the central bank, Bank Negara. Negara means uh, Malay for national. Facilitates the exchange rate. Facilitates the money. So, remember the one thing Mahathir did called the Vision 2020? Well, its predecessor, the new economy policy, was enforced by the first Prime Minister, Dun Abdul Razak, and you don't have to remember that name actually. The main purpose of new economy policy is... Uh, I don't know how to say, is to balance the economic situation of the nation. So, at that time, the nation's uh, economics are mainly controlled by Chinese. 
So, looking at that, the first prime minister thought that it would be better to spread the wealth among the races. You can see here, higher income, inclusiveness, and sustainability improves the quality of life, right? So, I'm going to take some of that, some of the good things that Chinese have, and spread it equally among the other races. Well, what happened is that, well, yes, the Chinese obviously feels oppressed, and they all go everywhere. They don't want to stay in Malaysia. But the Malays, they lost their competitive edge in the long run. So, yeah, but then again, looking at it, uh, looking at it sentimentally, you can see the good side is that the the national economy, like the equity ownership by Malays, rose up almost twenty percent since nineteen seventy. And the reason why is because the NEP and made sure that all companies listed in Malaysia must have 15% of their public share holding given to Malays. Yes, this is why it's like to do business, listed business in Malaysia. And a lot of economists have criticized the NEP, the economic policy for bring a semi-oligarchy to the economy. And this is why I say in the bad side is that there is no equality in this. This policy is just there to keep the Malays happy. I'm not trying to be racist, I'm just saying that it is not giving them a competitive edge. So, we go down to the natural resources. And Ever since the colonial age, Malaysia has been the center of production of goods such as petroleum, rubber, thin gold, and palm oil. And since World War II, actually, Malaysia has been producing rubber and tin for the war efforts. Japan actually came to Malaysia for the rubber. Well, they did. Other resources include, as of now, huge palm tree plantations that we can see for endless miles and in fact palm tree occupies 77% of the farmable land in Malaysia it's a lot so for the oil we have oil in Malaysia and it's produced on offshore oil drills like the one you see here out of the uh, I would say it's on the coast of Malay Peninsula and also on the other side. So it's a spread. And it's controlled by one company. You know what that is? Petronas. So I have one question here. Has anybody heard of this company? Because this company actually does some infamous sports sponsorship. Okay. Yes, they're in F1. They're also in MotoGP. Anyway, enough of the nerd stuff. Let's go to the next. So, in terms of global position of its economy, it's ranked 14th globally for competitiveness and 5th for countries with over 20 million people. This is 2015 data. I don't trust it anymore. But who knows? As for the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index of 2020, Malaysia is ranked 12th globally. Taiwan's 15. Yay! But I don't know if it is actually true in 2021 anymore. So, I'm going to show you a graph, okay? Oh no. Okay. See over here? This is the rankings of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 different factors that World Bank considers for doing ease of doing business in Malaysia. And you can see why its ranking is higher than Taiwan because on a few certain key factors of doing a business, it's actually very high. Like dealing with construction permits, it's at number two. Protecting minority investors, 
Number two, globally, that's very, very good. The rest are all pretty good spread. But then there's one thing that is very, very low, starting a business at 126 position. And yeah, I mean, this is actually kind of long because in terms of the position, like, it's ranked very low because the process of getting credit is very long. You can see here, this is the East Asia Pacific average. This is OECD high income average. It's in Malaysia's time, it's just awful long. And that's why I think this is deserved for them. Well, not all bad things. The good thing is that, at least the good thing is that getting credit in Malaysia is not the hardest thing to do, as it ranks 37th on the list. I forgot which list I checked. Oh, there you go, right there. Okay. When compared to China, Japan, and Taiwan, it's a lot easier to get credit. Like, China is 80th, Japan is 34th, and Taiwan is 104th. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So we go to the next sector, in the industrial service and infrastructure sector. So surprisingly, I don't know, is that Malaysia actually has a booming industrial sector in manufacturing of electronic parts. Yeah. And in 2019, it's actually 38% of its exports. Like seriously, I have no idea. I can look at the evolution of electronic production in Malaysia. You see, as it advanced till now, it's actually producing a lot of parts for the global semiconductor industry. And uh, I will say it is part of the reason why there is a chip shortage right now is because Malaysia is impacted quite heavily by the pandemic. And surprisingly, Malaysia is also one of the biggest product producer of solar panels in 2014 and it's also the largest producer of automotive in Southeast Asia and the 23rd globally thanks to Proton and also thanks Mahate and the financial sector is actually kind of well developed and well known at least on the Islamic side and it ranks 22nd in the global financial index and that it has the largest Islamic finance in the world. It's actually larger than United UAE in this. Yeah, that's actually one of their biggest banks, Islamic banks. And it's also tourism. Yeah, it's got to be one of them. You guys should have known. The reason why the tourist is famous because it's tropical island. And also it's because it's right beside Thailand and Bali. So, you know. They are close, they are similar, but I think Malaysia offers it at a lower cost because less people go there. Yeah, that's the truth. And then we go to the job opening for foreigners and application process. And uh, yeah. A quick search on the landscape of job for Malaysia, you'll see it's actually kind of like the same. IT sector. A lot of people, they want to go there. And because Malaysia has a very well developed finance sector, jobs related to finance and managers are also in high demand. Though, there are a few things to consider if you really want to work in Malaysia as a foreigner. I'm not saying to you guys you want to, but if you are interested, there are a few things to consider. First, is your English good enough? Your English must be at the level uh, that you can do presentations, talk to customers, and most importantly, you can listen to the accent that we will be speaking. This is actually a very good accent. In Malaysia, there's a lot of very bad accent people. So your English must be good. Otherwise, you will be you won't actually get a job there. It's actually one of the required 
The second is the Malaysia's unique cultures. Yeah, it's actually, if you guys don't know, it's quite similar to US in this regard. Let me tell you why. So first off, look at the right side. You can see this is actually a picture of a Malaysian road. Yeah, I can see trees. You can see the road is very big. You can see a lot of cars. And I can assure you one thing. In Malaysia, the public transportation is suck. They don't have good public transportation. You get anywhere, you need a car. If you don't have a car, get a taxi. That's it. So be prepared to look at this sort of landscape for a very long time if you want to work there. Because normally for me, if I want to go to somewhere, it's half an hour to one hour of driving. Yeah? Good. And as for other times when you want to like go and leisure, well, we have a lot of shopping malls. This picture of a shopping mall right here is actually a shopping mall in the Twin Towers, you know, the Pentronas Twin Towers. We have a lot of shopping malls and it's the only place for you to go if you want to have cold air and also to get your stuff done. Yeah, I mean, there are other places, but it's very hot in there. And also, if you are going to work there, you're going to see all these people down here. They will be your friends, they will be your employee, they will be your boss. You'll meet all kinds of people. So, unique cultures in Malaysia, get used to it. If you don't, yeah, I'm sorry. But this tree is about the same as Singapore, actually. Oh, Singapore, they don't drive that much. Yeah. They have good public transportation. Hmm. Okay. Then we go to the next one. Application process as according to Malaysian law. So first off, before you do anything, you must prove your eligibility for a work visa. First, valid passport, obviously. Second, you must be over 27 years old. And this is also where IT sector is better because you, as long as you're over 22 years old, you can get a job in the IT sector. Mm. Get your visa. Then we go to the types of work visas. First, employment pass. This is for spe specific skills only, like a technician, IT, you know, the hot demand jobs. Then second is temporary employment pass. It is for less than two year stay and for salary less than 5,000 Malaysian Ringgit. Oh, how much is 5,000 Malaysian Ringgit? Uh, you will see later. And then for the professional visit pass, we have the established individuals that requires visit to Malaysia for work purpose often. And uh, this is obviously for people who are going to have a business in Malaysia, but they need to work overseas. Then, to the next you'll see why I say we'll talk about this later good time to say what the average selling measure is like this is the figure from 2019 3,220 million ringgit how much is that in Taiwan dollars in today terms is 21,000 Taiwan dollars <laughs> yeah that's not very much sorry and this means that when I work in Taiwan as part time, I can get the average salary in Malaysia. And actually, speaking about this, my friends in Malaysia say my salary in Taiwan is higher than theirs by a long shot. Ah, yeah. Although, having said that, with 3,220 Malaysian ringgit, you can get a lot more done than 21,000 Taiwan dollars. Yes, I'll say that with certainty. Because looking at the house prices in 2021, the average had Malaysian ringgit 432,000 Malaysian ringgit. US for $103,000. Compared to Taiwan's 25.73 million new Taiwan dollars. Ooh, he enters the million. That means the average housing price is nine times higher in Taiwan than in Malaysia. So, 
this goes to show that with a lower salary, doesn't necessarily mean you can live a poor life. It just means that things are a lot cheaper. Okay, then if you want to work for longer, what can you do? First thing you can do, there's a new type of work permit called Lab One work permit. It's a new form of permit allows for quick setup of visa. Official website says it's 60 to 90 days to do a setup. Okay. That allows for 100% for ownership of companies to be set up because Remember from the mention, thing I mentioned above, if you are a listed company in Malaysia, you need 50% local Malay ownership. See my point? So, Lab One Work Permit is actually one of the newest form of work permit that offers a one-stop solution to everything you need to do in Malaysia. And and the benefit from the for the lab one work permit is that you can have uh, multiple visas registered from just one work permit, and also you can have uh, multiple reentries, and also you can get your parents or dependents. Yeah, very convenient. Second is to just set up your own business and apply for Malaysia two years a uh, DP ten work permit under your own. Malaysian SDN BHD company. That's the short form for what's on the PPT. Sandirian Berhad Company. And this in Malay means uh, private limited. Cool. And it comes in two forms foreign owned or joint venture. So for foreign owned, it's a non resident company where foreigners can own 100% of their company. So set up you need a minimum required authorized capital of 1 million Malaysian Ringgit. So that means you must have minimum of 500,000 Malaysian Ringgit shares. And uh, the process for this, 6 to 9 months for just the application and visa. And if you want a physical office there, then uh, get prepared for a longer registration. And for foreign companies, it is also required required to get a WRT license. It's just a license to make sure that your company offers benefits to the nation. I don't know other countries if they've ever done that, but this is actually kind of a lengthy process. Ah. So if you don't want that, well, you can get a joint venture. Oh, actually, I forgot to mention, for everything except the first lab one work permit, you need to go to the SSM. This is uh, too much Malay for me. Suru Surahanjaya Sirai Gai Malaysia. Basically, like the Lao Dong Bu, Lao Dong Ju of Taiwan. So, for joint venture, with local Malaysian for the Malaysian private limited company it's a lot easier because you don't have to get the WRT license and as for this time the you are merging with a com local company that will have 50% or more of the company's share so also the benefit of a joint venture is that the paid capital required for the work permit is 350,000 Malaysian Ringgit. So the third method is to be employed by a Malaysian company or regional office. Same requirement as a work visa, you need a salary of 5,000 Malaysian Ringgit. Quite high actually. Fourth is to set up your regional office in Malaysia. And with this, you can get a work permit for two to five years. And the requirement for this is that your company must be active for two years in the home country and it actually gives the longest work permit du the work visa duration from this list so take note and so how you start a business in Malaysia oh do you remember I said that Malaysia's uh, ease of starting business ranking is 126 from the World Bank ranking do you know why well here is why 
Oh, before that, I have to explain that they are natural Malaysians. We are generally a more relaxed nation with flexibility on both ends. So people from more quick paced nation will say we are lazy, but I would just say, well, everybody is lazy, so suck up and uh, be lazy. And uh, also because the nation is a lot more careful than Taiwan for say, because they have a Islamic law, so they don't want things to go freely. And uh, yeah, this actually this this list of procedures is actually what I copied from the World Bank uh, survey because it's it's a lot easier to explain this way. So I will tell you how you can do it. So first is you need to search and reserve a company name at the SSM one stop shop the one you see just now the very long Malay word so reserve a name how much 50 ringgit MR50 for 30 days and then second the company's secretary which you will have to employ if you don't want to do with all this ridiculous amount of work for a long time prepares the company's incorporation documents and details of what to be prepared is on the separate list a lot of things just continue then third step is to file necessary documents with the CCM Companies Commission of Malaysia one stop shop one stop shop and uh, obtain company info corporation as well as post incorporation package that means at the third step you get company seals, share certificates and statutory books the necessary things to get your business going fourth step is to register for the sales and service tax STT how much? original tax 5% and if you are sell, selling goods is 10% and if it's uh, services and 6% these are not separate taxes, these are add-on to the 5%. So 15% if you're selling goods, 11% if you're doing services. Yeah. Fifth is to register for, register for income tax and PIEYE. And also employees provide them fund and social security. A lot of things. Then sixth, finally, you get a business premise license. Yay, you are done. This is why it's 126 position. I mean, if you know how many t steps Taiwan you will take, you need to take in Taiwan. I have to agree that Taiwan is a lot faster. This is just ridiculous. But looking at what the other rankings of this chart means, I mean, if you are just going to have to deal with one very slow thing to get your business going, to enjoy all the benefits of other parts, I would say go for it because I mean, the reason why it's 12 ranked globally for ease of doing business is not without a reason. It's just that to start it is a lot more difficult. So, yeah, it's a good nation. For say, the conclusions. Yeah, time to wrap up, man. Malaysia is a nation with a troubled past and a questionable future. But I'm willing to bet this nation is not on a downward trend, but on a promising trajectory to be better. Why? Because it has always been a nation of trade. Like since 19th century, Malaysia is a na nation with multiple cultures coexisting before the politicians made it horrible. And uh, yes. Malaysia is on a, is on the developing nations list. It's still there, when South Korea and Taiwan have become developed nations. They are still there. But this means that if you are very hardworking in Malaysia, you can contribute to the nation a lot. And that's not saying in a very like a sacrificial way. It's just that. There are a lot of potentials for those who are hardworking. 
awaiting the bright-minded people. And this is what I think the developing nations' characteristic is: is that there's a lot of opportunities around. And I think all the of all the nationality in my class, my country is the least well known. Like nobody knows what they really have. Well, no, I will not be mad because it's just that my country is not very good at doing publicity. But think about it. This means that entrepreneurs that is willing to make jump can pretty much ensure a great return on investment. This is actually a proof from a people who from somebody who talk about startup in Malaysia. They say that. The return on investment is very very high if you know what you're doing. So yeah, Malaysia is open for business for all who dare to challenge. The second title, and uh, yeah, as a bonus, it's actually very close to Indonesia's Bali Islands and Thailand's tourist location. The plane tickets are very very cheap, so working there. Is a good way to say. I work in a very, I work in a more stable environment while I get to enjoy holidays elsewhere. See, it's a good thing. And more on the CCK, if you cannot get into Singapore to work, well, Malaysia is the best spot for you. That's my honest opinion. And we have two questions here for those who want to answer. Other than that. That is my presentation, and、uh, yeah, this is my last presentation for Doctor Shu. And good luck to those who are going to America. Very good luck to those who are going to America but not DBU. And the best of luck for those who are still looking for their future in America. Thank you, everybody.